More than 90% of women worldwide give birth to at least one child, and I count myself among those women. Having a child changes you. It changes the way you think. It changes your motivations and behaviors. Becoming a mother requires transformation from a self-focused individual to an other-focused one. Which brings me to the idea I want to share with you today. The idea that mothers are made, not born. The idea that the perinatal period represents a critical period of neurological development, not only for the fetus, but for the mother as well. And that women possess an inherent and dramatic neuroplasticity that is primed during pregnancy and further stimulated by delivery, lactation, and mother-child interaction. So why think of this as a critical period in the lifespan of the female? Well, for me, there are several good reasons, and the first has to do with evolution and survival of the species. Humans are unique, even among our closest primate relatives, in the sheer amount of parental investment required to raise offspring to adulthood. Human offspring are vulnerable and heavily dependent on their parents for many years of their lives. They require help to avoid a number of hazards, including sometimes themselves. And they, in addition to needing protection, they also need to sustenance, not to mention piano, swim lessons, and rides to soccer practice. <laughs> Human offspring are precious in another way as well, which is that we, as humans, produce relatively few in the course of our lifetimes. Women living in a natural fertility society would produce, on average, 2.4 offspring that survive into adulthood. Losing just one of those children would reduce a mother's lifetime reproduction by nearly 50%. Not surprisingly, based on these facts, evolutionary biologists have argued that the development of maternal behaviors represents one of the most primary forces shaping the development of the evolution of the mammalian brain. And others have argued further that, unfortunately, because the male or father is often unavailable due to things like competition-related injury, death, or because he's paying attention to other females, the burden has fallen on the female nervous system to protect our vulnerable genetic legacy. The second reason to think of this as a critical period of neural development in the female lifespan has to do with hormones. None of you will find it surprising when I tell you that hormones change dramatically during pregnancy. What I do think is underappreciated, though, is the sheer magnitude of these changes. There are no other naturally occurring hormone exposures in the lifespan of the female that match those of the per perinatal period. And to illustrate this for you, what I've done is plot in red the peak estrogen level during the menstrual cycle, and in purple, the peak during pregnancy. I'll give you a moment to take it in, because it may change the meaning of pregnancy hormones for you. <laughs> There's a substantial empirical literature that suggests that other lesser endocrine events, like menopause, puberty, even the menstrual cycle, results in changes in brain structure and function suggesting that we ought to accept similar, expect similar or even larger changes associated with the hormone exposures of pregnancy. The third reason that has led me to consider this a critical period of development for women is listening to women themselves. It's anecdotal observation. It's the fact that women widely report that becoming a mother and going through pregnancy changes almost every aspect of their lives. More than 80% of new mothers report that they have difficulty remembering things they were able to remember before pregnancy. This phenomenon is so common that women have come to call it mommy brain. And this is an issue we'll return to in a bit. So if we accept that this is a critical period of neuro neurological development, what do we know about it? What do we know about the architecture of the maternal brain? Well, it turns out that we know quite a bit from non-human animal models. And when I say non-human animal models, I mean almost exclusively these non-human animals. Scientists have spent several decades now researching the architecture of the maternal brain, and from these rodent models, we know quite a bit. We know, for example, that the olfactory system starts churning out new neurons. This enhances the mother's sense of smell and probably helps to solidify the mother-pup bond. We know that an area of the brain called the medial preoptic area, which is an area that is involved in the onset and maintenance of maternal behaviors, is changed as well. And in this area, we see increased neuronal growth and activity. We also know that the areas of the brain that change are not confined to those strictly involved in pup care. The hippocampus, 
for example, starts to show neuronal growth. And this is an area of the brain that's intimately involved in memory function. From the mom rats, we also know that these changes in brain and behavior translate, in, these changes in the brain translate into changes in behavior. Mother rats exhibit better attention, enhanced memory, they're more effective foragers, and they're also better planners. In addition, mother rats are bolder. Probably this helps in that more efficient foraging and aids in, making, in, in helping them um, fend off threats to their offspring. There are two more global things that you should know about the maternal brain from these rodent models. The first is that these changes, most of these changes in brain and behavior persist throughout the lifespan of the female. And the other is that for many of these changes, the effects are cumulative. And what that means is, with every litter to which she gives birth, her functions and behaviors are further enhanced. So this is what we know from rodent moms, persistent, pervasive, and cumulative changes. What about human, what about human mothers? This may be the first surprising thing I tell you about pregnancy today, and that is we know almost nothing. There really does exist a critical knowledge gap in our understanding of the human maternal brain. We do know a few things, though, and I'm going to tell you a bit about them. We know, for example, that women during pregnancy, like rats and other species, actually show a down-regulation of physiological and behavioral stress responses. If you present a pregnant woman with a challenge, whether it's a physical stressor or a psychological one, her stress hormone responses will be smaller, and so will her heart rate and blood pressure responses compared to a non-pregnant woman. And it turns out that what's going on with her psychology tracks what's going on with her physiology. So to illustrate this, I wanted to show you some data from a group of Southern California women who were pregnant when a 6.9 magnitude earthquake hit the region. This really affected the region. It resulted in 59 deaths and about 14 billion in property damage, so it was, had a significant impact on the community. And what we observed in these pregnant women was that the women who experienced this earthquake during their first trimester rated as much more stressful than those who experienced it during the third, and the women who experienced it in the second, and the women who experienced it in the third trimester found that same earthquake to be much less stressful. So really underscoring this down-regulation of stress responding. And we think that this down-regulated stress response actually serves an adaptive purpose, which is to protect mother and fetus from the adverse effects of stress, particularly late in gestation. And there's actually some evidence to suggest that this may be the case. Women who do not exhibit this normative, expected, down-regulation stress responding are actually at increased risk for delivering a preterm infant. We also think that this down-regulated stress response serves a second purpose, which is to enhance the mother's ability to fend off threats to herself and her offspring. It turns out that decreased fear is associated with the increased ability to deal with external threats. And we also know that this down-regulated stress response, which appears during gestation, is maintained in the postpartum period by lactation and breastfeeding. You're probably all familiar with the old adage, don't come between a mother bear and her cubs. Well, don't come between a breastfeeding woman and her infant either. <laughs> Exclusively breastfeeding moms are more than twice as likely to aggress in response to provocation as women of similar demographics who have never given birth. And this is true even when they're not in the presence of their infant. Further, it's the case that this, the women who show the smallest physiological response to the provocation are the ones who show the most aggression in response, suggesting again that this down-regulated stress response is helping to fend the, off those threats. Not only do mothers gain an ability to fend threats off, but we know that they may also gain a tool in their arsenal which would allow them to identify threats more easily. Late in pregnancy, women develop an enhanced ability to discriminate emotions, particularly those involved with threats, so fear, anger, and disgust. Again, suggesting mom is going to be better not only at fending them off, off the threats, but also identifying them. So this is the good news. Human mothers, like rat mothers, appear to be exhibiting some positive adaptations associated with becoming a mother. Unfortunately, we also believe that the restructuring of the maternal brain may come at a cost, and you'll Remember back to the mommy brain I referenced earlier. A while ago, I followed a large cohort of a couple hundred women through pregnancy and into the postpartum period and assessed their cognitive performance compared to a group of non-pregnant women. 
What I found was that for specific types of cognitive functions, particularly verbal memory, which is the ability to do things like recall word lists, the pregnant women were showing diminished performance. What's more, like many of those rodent models I told you about, the effects were cumulative. So here is the memory performance of women giving birth to their first child. Higher numbers here mean better performance. Here is the performance of women giving birth to their second child. And here is the performance of women for whom this is at least their third delivery. When I first analyzed these data, I had two responses. My professional response was to find them stimulating and exciting. I'd spent several years of my life collecting these data. They validated women's anecdotal reports of what was going on with their cognitive function. But I have to say, my personal response was to find this a bit horrifying. And my immediate question was, has given birth to these two ruined my brain? <laughs> Do these effects that emerge during pregnancy persist? The short answer to that question is, we don't know. <laughs> For certain functions we do know, such as verbal memory, that some of this impairment does stretch out into the first postpartum year. Beyond that, the answer is not known. Now, as depressing as that may seem, I want, I, I want to remind you and, and take a an broader evolutionary perspective again, which is to remind us that Cognitive functions like verbal recall memory are relatively recent adaptations, and while they're probably essential, or they are essential, for optimal performance in the modern workplace, for example, they're probably less central in successful caring for an infant. And if the maternal brain is to be remodeled, it would be in the service of creating the most efficient, the most effective, and the most sensitive mother. We're just beginning to take a peek into the human maternal brain with MRI technology. And fairly recently, it was reported that during the postpartum period, women actually show an increase in gray matter volumes. Gray matter is this layer of your brain that is just packed full with neurons. What you see highlighted in red are the areas of the brain which showed increases in volumes from three weeks to three months postpartum. One interesting thing about these changes is that they are the areas of the brain that are involved in infant care. And another interesting finding which may be even more fascinating, is that the women who reported the most positive perceptions of their infants, that is, the women who reported their infants to be the most beautiful and the most ideal and the most perfect, were also the women that showed the largest gray matter volume increases in these areas. So a really striking example of this dramatic neuroplasticity associated with motherhood that I've been talking about. And I think this study represents just the tip of the iceberg for us in terms of characterizing the human maternal brain. So what I've told you today may not seem particularly surprising or revolutionary. Many of you are probably mothers, all of you have one, and you arrived with the idea that motherhood changes women profoundly. You didn't need a scientist to stand here and tell you that. I've also been telling you that evolution has spent hundreds of thousands of years fine-tuning the maternal brain. So why do I consider this to be one of the most critical knowledge gaps in all of women's health and well-being today? Furthering our knowledge of the neurological changes associated with the perinatal period will not only allow women and their health care providers to better understand changes in behavior and function during and after pregnancy, but will also allow greater understanding of women's lifespan development with important implications for things like dementia and cognitive aging. We know, for example, that rodent mothers exhibit a striking neuroprotection from cognitive aging that is not shared by their pupless counterparts. In addition to helping us understand women's lifespan development, increasing our knowledge in this area has the potential to make intervention possible. For clinical syndromes such as Downs and others, we have standard prenatal tests available to provide information and guide treatment decisions. It is my hope that in the coming years, with a more comprehensive understanding of the human maternal brain, we will be able to identify women who are at risk for things like postpartum depression and psychosis or compromised maternal care. With this increased knowledge, we have the potential to develop specific and successful interventions with great potential to increase both maternal and child health. Thank you.